Hey! 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 W would you keep it down? I'm trying to do a review show here. Star Wars games. On PSP. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> If you wanted to visit a galaxy far, far away in your pocket, the PSP had a nice selection of titles, and we're gonna be looking at all of them today. Remember when Anakin had that PSP in Revenge of the Sith? Nah, oh, that wasn't no Vita. No, that, my friend, was a PSP. What do you think he was playing on there? Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? Oh, he about to get that high score. Maybe he was playing Battlefront 2, the first Star Wars game to make it on the PSP. I already talked about this game in my PSP anniversary video, but to sum up, it was mind-blowing to have this major console release available on a handheld squeezing this game on PSP came at a cost, and that was losing the campaign, which got replaced with these random mission objectives and trials it is kind of disappointing. There's also no narration during the gameplay, voice lines are cut, and a lot of my favorite maps are gone. Why did they have to take out the Death Star? But when it comes to actual gameplay, this port is one to one. It controls surprisingly well and is a ton of fun when you just want to scratch that Battlefront 2 itch on the go. As a kid and even today, I'm taken aback by how well this port works. Like I have no problem lining up my shots, knocking down stormtroopers, and doing my part for the Rebel Alliance. Come on, take the shot. Everybody's depending on me. Yes, I did it. I saved Star Wars. Yay. Thanks to mods, the voice lines and maps that were missing are back, meaning this experience is just perfect for me. Definitely pick this one up if you can, it's still amazing, it's dirt cheap, and it's Battlefront 2 in your pocket. Next year we got LEGO Star Wars 2, the original trilogy, another game I went in depth about so I'm gonna keep it brief here. This port is the console experience on the go. No other way to put it. It was astonishing to see this at the time. It's, it's not like LEGO games are graphically intense or whatever, but you need to keep in mind. The alternatives at the time on Game Boy Advance and DS were completely different games. So getting a handheld version of a game that was just like what everyone else had on home console was a brand new experience. The only real cut here was that the characters you unlock no longer walk around the cantina, okay. But other than that, this is the same game we all grew up with and know and love. It's amazing. And it's my preferred way to play this game now just because I love the simplicity of it and it makes so much sense on a handheld. Next up is a game that came out of nowhere. Lethal Alliance. I never saw any marketing for this game. I don't know a single person who played it. Nothing. Nobody ever talks about it. I never see reviews about it. Nada. I remember this game just showing up in stores one day and I was like, huh, that's neat. And I passed up on it. Me, a Star Wars obsessed kid who had a PSP, looked at this brand new Star Wars game and said, nah. This game also came out the same month as the Wii and PS3, so it was absolutely crowded for video games. It probably got buried under so many releases. Now, 15 years later, i finally given this game a fair chance. How does it hold up? You play as a Twi'lek named Rihanna, I shit you not. In this game, you help steal the Death Star plans for a guy named Kyle. If this sounds familiar, there already was a game you might have already played called Dark Forces with Kyle Katarn, where you steal the Death Star plans. Kyle returns in this one and uh, what did they do to you, man? He, he looks like Falco Lombardi if he drank the potion from Shrek 2. The in-universe explanation for these contradictory plots is that you are stealing an updated version of the Death Star plans or something. Who cares? Oh, so the little Doritos got to shoot the little hole thing. Okay, see, with the old plans, we were just going to gank that motherfucker. Who's with me, boys? Woohoo! You start off on Coruscant as a merc for hire and you meet your droid companion Zeo who can help you stun and dispatch enemies during shootouts and he can help with some light platforming. A lot of the gameplay loop boils down to hold off enemies while droid hack door. It can get repetitive but considering how little I hear about this game it was pretty fun. Yeah the shooting mechanics are pretty basic but that's not necessarily a bad thing especially because for a handheld third person action game the controls and animations are very fluid. When you get up close to an enemy, you can do these cool takedown moves with this weapon called the Thorn of Rylon. See? Pretty neat, huh? The gameplay here kind of reminds me a bit of Tomb Raider meets Ratchet meets Prince of Persia. That last one makes a lot of sense when you remember this game was developed by Ubisoft. And as the game progresses, you unlock more weapons and abilities and some more stealthier approaches. Oh, don't mind me, think the maker and whatnot. Yes, yes, fine weather for protocol we're having, wouldn't you? There are no strings on me, meatbag. 
They do throw in some different gameplay sections to break things up here and there. Apparently, if you've ever lived on Coruscant, it's a rite of passage to hang for dear life to a small droid while zipping through hover traffic. Happens to all of us, what you gonna do? Playing this game also reminded me a lot of Shadows of the Empire on N64, two serviceable Star Wars action games that don't need things like petty lightsabers to have fun. Both have their moments, but I wouldn't classify them as essential to play Star Wars games. If you're looking for a fun third-person shooter campaign on the PSP, Lethal Alliance really is some of the best. Yeah! Thanks, Zio. Next up is Renegade Squadron. I remember Googling two things a lot as a kid, and that was Toy Story 3 and Battlefront 3. I scoured the net wondering when are these two things finally gonna happen? One eventually did get announced and came out, the other, well, it's a little bit of a sore, sub sore subject for me. In my research, Renegade Squadron was announced to be coming out, but only for the PSP. Immediately in my head that set off some red flags, why are we getting this instead of BF3, but whatever, I'll take it, just give me something, I need it. Eventually it came out, I got the game, and what I ended up with was sheer confusion. See, we already had Battlefront 2 on PSP, so all I really wanted out of this game was, was more. More maps, more improvements, and call it a day. I wasn't asking for much. The problem is, instead of using that already existing port to Battlefront 2 as a framework, this game decided to do its own thing. You can no longer free aim, instead you are tied to a lock-on system, making every enemy encounter feel very automated. This shouldn't be much of an issue, since Battlefront 2 basically had a free aim with a very tight lock-on system, but here it's much more sluggish. It doesn't feel snappy like in BF2, at least in that game it felt like you had a semblance of control with your aim. They do offer an alternate control scheme with more freedom, but it doesn't feel as good. It controls like a hasty afterthought. It's quite obvious that the main Z targeting type system is really what this game was designed around. My guess is that they did this to streamline everything and make Battlefront an easier game to play portably, but we already had that. Why change so much? For example, one thing you could do in Battlefront 2, even on PSP, was jump your way to the highest points of the map and get, you know, these vantage points on buildings. In Renegade Squadron, even buildings within the main sections of the map are barred by a ton of invisible walls. Why restrict such a simple thing? That annoyance aside, I actually did have a good amount of fun with this game for what it was. Even though the controls are much more restricting, this game offers freedom in other areas and lets you cause absolute destruction. The major change that came with Renegade Squadron is instead of classes, you get customization with all your characters, which is a sweet change. You can be a purple Republic Commando or a hulking Magna Guard. You can basically make yourself a jetpack wielding god that rains death on your enemies. You could be a merc from Mon Calamari that can stun enemies and blast their face off with wrist rockets. What more do you want? This is easily the best part about this game. Another thing that makes Renegade Squadron really unique is that a lot of its maps are based on locations from the expanded universe, planets I hadn't even heard of at the time. It was really cool to be shooting out the Sith Temple on Korriban. I thought that was so awesome. And some of these maps just look gorgeous on the PSP. I was pretty impressed. A lot of the old heroes and villains from the last game return, we get some new ones. You can now play as Admiral Akbar, and he is super OP. Not even Boba Fett can stop the fish man. He can call in an orbital strike. My god. Holy shit, guys. I just realized. I am Star Wars. IG-88 is also here. He is a meat grinding flesh bag murder machine. He's dope. Django Fett is also a ton of fun. Kit Fisto is here. Ventress is here. If you didn't have the Xbox version of Battlefront 2, these were completely new characters for the series for you. The only problem is any hero or villain that has a lightsaber, they control like space booty. And not the good kind. They just flail their lightsabers. There's no impact with any of your swings, nothing. I am not quite sure what happened here or why they didn't just build off the hero animations from Battlefront 2, but something really went wrong. They're still powerful, like look at my man General Grievous, he can still do damage, but his animations are, are like broken or something. What did they do to you man? His sprint is hilariously bad, it's super slow, it looks like an 8 year old stop motion animation of a bionicle. There's one thing I actually do really like about Renegade Squadron, it feels like a much more complete experience on PSP. 
because now there's an actual campaign where you play as a secret band of rebels that Han Solo commissioned that did all the super important stuff off screen. I don't care about canon, my OC of a Calamarian Buzz Lightyear of Death is actually the most important Star Wars character ever. And he has a bajillion midichlorians, and he's hung. Also, the space battles here are way better and more fleshed out than the bare bones mode the PSP version of Battlefront 2 had. There are even hero and villain ships now, which is a nice addition. If you want a complete Battlefront game on PSP, I think you might as well get this one even though I'm not a fan of some of its changes. At the time, this game seemed like it was going to be a nice sampler for what we would get with Battlefront 3, which made the hype even greater. And surely that game would be coming any minute now. Any minute. Any Next game we got on PSP was The Force Unleashed. This damn game came out on everything somehow. Everybody had to experience The Force Unleashed. And the PSP version is a very impressive port, especially when you consider when this game was coming out, it was marketed as this big next-gen experience. You were taking down a Star Destroyer. There was no way this could be done without the new modern hardware. And then it came out on DS. This PSP version is largely based on the PS2 and Wii port, but it's also a bit of its own thing. I was surprised how well it translated here. It's all about large displays of force power and hack and slashing through stormtroopers and it all works. The presentation and the story is still intact. It's a pretty neat way to experience this game and it definitely is the best handheld rendition. In fact, out of all the ports, it has the most modes and unique features like these historical missions, which let you play through scenes from the movie so you can see all the memes in their perfect portable glory. I shouldn't. Do it. Yeah. Boy, am I glad Obi-Wan's passed the fuck out so he can't see me shred this badass Sith Lightning. Haha, <laughs> Anakin. I knew Sith Lightning the whole time. I just didn't teach you because you're such a whiny little bitch. The main campaign's fun, but playing through these moments from the movie, it's really dope. Even get an opportunity to rewrite history if you want. Like, instead of uh, defeating Anakin, Obi-Wan just throws him into a pool of lava like he should have done. Haha. <laughs> -ha, I did it. I saved Star Wars. 2009, we got Republic Heroes. Oh, how fun. Everybody loves the Clone Wars, all right? It's great, but you gotta understand when the show came out, it was rough. The show wasn't good overnight, and it especially wasn't the beloved series it was today. And of course, with the show, we immediately got product tie-ins like Republic Heroes. At first, with the opening, it seems like it might be promising. A little fun side story of the show, but quickly, it's clear that this is a generic game for small children. You know, I never thought I'd hear Yoda say the words, uh, Super Jump Attack. You're from a higher place. Perform a Super Jump Attack, you can. The frame rate is awful, the gameplay is repetitive, it plays out like a filler episode of the series, and somehow they've managed to reduce wielding a lightsaber and force powers, things that should be extremely fun, to this boring budget game. Having fun you are? Mmm, yes. Watch more Clone Wars at 8, 7 central on Fridays on Cartoon Network. You will. Like, look at this lightsaber throw. It's, it's disgusting. It's pathetic. Republic Heroes is just a bland port of a bland game for a show that was still finding its footing. Follow me, Snips. Let's not waste any time, Snips. Behind you, Sky Guy. Nice one, Sky Guy. Hey, Sky Guy. We got company. I'm thinking of ending things. Honestly, I can find value in all Star Wars games on the PSP, except this one. Sorry, I just, this one, it's just there, it exists, and it just happens to exist on the PSP. No thank you. That same year, we got Battlefront Elite Squadron. Now, this one was always a bit elusive to me because I'd always see it and just knew it was probably a dumbed down Battlefront spinoff that pales in comparison to the mainline games and was probably just another Renegade Squadron type affair. And it is, this game builds off Renegade Squadron, but makes some weird decisions. At first glance, the presentation really is a step up from that game, and hey, there's an actual campaign again. I always wanted to know what this game was about, and I can tell you, it's got this real cheesy fanfic quality to it. Don't believe me? 
To start off, you play as a clone trooper named X2. You and your brother X1 fight alongside each other in the Clone Wars, except they aren't clones based off of Jango Fett like the other clones in the movie. Instead, their DNA was unknowingly taken by the Kaminoans from a Jedi named Balin Gray. Order 66 gets executed and you kill a blue Jedi named Frodo who happens to be the same species as the alien character that George Lucas played in the brief cameo in Revenge of the Sith in its opera scene. Bring your actions, you defect from the Empire, unlike your brother X1 who remains loyal to the Empire and helps hunt down the last remaining Jedi, including your Jedi Papa, who was quickly killed after he reveals that you're strong in the Force. So, you run off and join the Rebellion and help defeat the Empire until you eventually train to be a true Jedi under Luke Skywalker and visit Darth Vader's castle to retrieve your father's lightsaber and stop your evil Sith clone brother from creating an army of dark Wookiee clones on Mustafer. That's right, dark Wookiee clones on Mustafer. And you face your clone brother in one last duel, but refuse to kill him, which prompts him to pull Spider-Man 1 and pale himself like the Green Goblin. And then he falls on the lava like Golem. Ha uh, I saved Star Wars, I think. So yeah, the story's pretty out there even for Star Wars standards, and I was down with it. But it's very poorly told here. The actual presentation becomes very bare bones as the story progresses. From what I can understand, Elite Squadron and its plot are basically the remnants of Free Radicals Battlefront 3. After that game got cancelled, they took the concept from that game and downsized it to the PSP level. You can even watch some of these leaked Battlefront 3 cutscenes and really see what the story was going to be like, actual characters and storytelling, we would actually see X1 and X2 bond. In the PSP version, they don't really do any of this justice. I mean, the recap I gave you earlier is more in-depth than what the game actually tells you. There are really only like three cutscenes, and the rest of the story is told through these title crawls. It, it seems like while developing Elite Squadron, they really only had the scraps of Battlefront 3 to work with, and they just glued it all together in this quick PSP spin-off. This whole time, this random PSP game that got no marketing, the game I would see every so often dismiss, was really the shoddily put together remnants of the cancelled game I was obsessed with. It sucks. Like, one of the big concepts behind Battlefront 3 was that you were going to be able to seamlessly switch from ground to space combat. It's here, you can switch between ground and space, but it's not what you think. It's broken up by these transitional cutscenes and there's no real interaction between these different levels of the battle. You never really get the sense that what you're doing at one place is really affecting the battle at the other. Like, it's really impressive to see some of this stuff on PSP at first, seeing these larger environments, but the illusion quickly starts to wear off when you realize, once again, a lot of things are very restricted. We're back to the old, why can't I just land on top of this building problem? Weird design choices, like the customization is now back, but it's behind this boring new UI where everything is listed off for you and all the fun stuff is locked away. The flamethrower, the jetpack, you can't use any of this stuff. At first I thought, okay, maybe if I just keep playing the campaign, eventually I'll unlock it, makes sense. So each level I said, uh, can I please have the jetpack now? No. I played through the whole campaign and nothing. Nothing! I want my Buzz Lightyear of Death, what the hell? Apparently most of these unlocks are tied to the online multiplayer which no longer works. Or playing a bunch of Galactic Conquest. Why? Why take such a cool and effective idea from the last game and bar it through hours of bland gameplay? Just let me do what I want to do! It's like with every Battlefront game on PSP, they ask how can we make this game bigger, but also worse. Like for one, the space combat is now more arcadey, but it doesn't feel as engaging. For example, there's this one part where you have to defend your friendly transports while taking down a bunch of TIE fighters. I took some damage, so I thought, what the hell? I'll just land somewhere real quick and repair my ship. After all, the whole point of this game is to traverse through different stages of the map. But the game wouldn't let me land, so I was forced to do this entire section on low health. In the old Battlefront games, if this happened, you could quickly land in a hangar, switch your ship or repair it, and rejoin the fight. Here, nope, you have to play the game exactly the way it wants you to. The whole appeal of this entire series was being able to approach situations the way you saw fit, depending on what class you wanted to play. Renegade Squadron took this a step further and said, hey, go nuts. If you want to be a big dick merc with a jetpack that can freeze bucket heads before blasting their balls off with a wrist rocket, fucking do it. Now you're tied to the same few loadouts, most of which are useless save for one or two moments. Once you do become a Jedi in the game, things start to pick up. Even though the hero animations are still a little wonky, they are way better here than in Renegade Squadron. Your attacks are way more responsive and fluid, and I did have a decent amount of fun in these later parts of the game. Oh my fucking god, it's Lobot. We're saved. There was this one part on this Bespin level where a bunch of gargantuan dark troopers showed up and I had to slaughter them all with Lando and Lobot and I thought, damn, does this game have its moments. You, you know they totally ripped this part off for the Mandalorian. John, you sneaky bastard, is that a PSP in your pocket? Shields are up. Take evasive action. It's a trap. Like, yeah, this story was straight ripped from fanfic.net, but that's also kind of the charm. Like, this early part of the game where you help Mace Windu fucking take General Grievous head on. That's right, clone trooper. Whack him with a stick. Yeah. I helped. Again, Elite Squadron is a game you rarely ever hear about, and being the last Battlefront game that followed that old style, it's kind of weird to see what was once this huge series end on such a strange, oddball note on the PSP, no less. They must have really been banking on this thing or didn't care about it much because they released this a week before Modern Warfare 2. 
So there you go, mystery solved. They wanted this game to die. A DS port of Elite Squadron came out alongside it being a more top-down game when I think that just goes to show later in the PSP's life, ports were becoming more rare. Many publishers opted to go with a cheaper, easier DS port for their games. It almost seems like we were lucky to get this PSP port at all. So what about 2010? Well, we were supposed to get Force Unleashed 2 on PSP, but that version was quietly cancelled and they refused to give a reason why, but I think it was clear what was going on here. Instead, LucasArts said FU2 and just released it on DS. 2010 really was the last big year for the PSP in terms of releases. You could tell this console was in its last moments in the spotlight. In terms of ports, it was pretty much coming down to sports titles, weep shit, and LEGO games. Which brings us to... LEGO Star Wars 3 The Clone Wars. Again, I want to preface this by saying I like the Clone Wars, but this game's existence at the time came across as heinous to me. Like, how dare you call yourself LEGO Star Wars 3 and make it Clone Wars themed, you cheap kids show tie-in piece of garbage. I did not give this one a chance. I felt like I had grown out of LEGO and a bit out of Star Wars at the time, and this was like the most kiddified pairing of these two things imaginable, a LEGO version of a kid show. The console versions of Clone Wars for a LEGO game did always look pretty flashy and ambitious, even though I wasn't interested in the game. It was hard to deny it looked a lot grander in scope, so for that game to be here on the PSP, it definitely seemed like it was going to be a challenge for the smaller handheld. But, I believe it was Master Yoda who said, Matter not the size of the system. Yes, the system. Buy more LEGO sets you will. Hmm, look at how many pieces there are. It is three to 99. Yoda too old for Lego. Just want to swallow one piece. At first booting this game up, I was pretty excited. I mean, a new Lego Star Wars game in the old style based on the episodes of the show I love uh, on the PSP. Hell yeah. And admittedly, seeing some of these moments from the show was really cool. But then you quickly realize, oh dear. Yep. This is one of those DS ports. Yeah, see, LEGO Star Wars 2 on PSP was able to deliver the full experience on the game on a handheld, as were some of the other LEGO games like LEGO Batman and Indiana Jones, but as time progressed, making three different versions for three handhelds was just too much, so instead we basically got the DS version of these games ported up to PSP and later to the 3DS. It's pretty disappointing, it's not like the PSP couldn't handle these games, it just would have been a lot more work. As for why we never got LEGO Star Wars A Complete Saga on PSP, I don't know, it was a complete mystery. They had half the work done already right there. I mean, still, I'm fucking so- <laughs> I mean, you look at this and, and it, it just looks like some early iPhone game. You know that slightly top-down look? All the level design is super linear and boring. Even little things like collecting the studs and blowing boxes up and building stuff, it, just, it doesn't have any of the impact anymore. It's, it's weak. I really don't see the value in playing this game, especially now, like, yeah, go ahead and say it's for kids, but give children some credit. Even they know when they're missing out on something better. And that's really where Star Wars on PSP ends, on kind of a dour note where you realize what started out as a handheld with promising titles that offered that console experience on the go eventually fizzled out and struggled to keep up. But overall, the majority of these games are great. I, I think aside from all the titles we talked about, there was supposed to be a PSP port of Revenge of the Sith, the official movie game. It got announced the same day as the DS and GBA version, but it just never came out. Probably because the actual release date was only seven months away and they realized it just wasn't going to work out, but beyond that announcement, I couldn't find any evidence that this game actually existed. There's no footage of any builds, no screenshots ever released, nothing. It'd be cool if it turned up one day, but that PSP port was quietly cancelled and we've never heard a word since. I mean, it's weird to think that there's just a Star Wars- Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. I sense something. Could it be? No, no, yo, no,